Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Joy Cohen, a Career Development Manager here at Google. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone before we get started that books are on sale in the back for $5. We're very pleased to welcome Rich Horwath for an At Google Talk. He comes to us with a plan, a plan to experience more of what life has to offer. He's the author of Strategy for You, Building a Bridge to the Life You Want. Using principles of strategic thinking, Rich offers advice for finding what you truly want. He offers a five-step program toward managing your career and your life. Rich is the CEO of Strategic Thinking Institute, where he's helped over 50,000 managers develop their strategic thinking skills. He's also the publisher of the monthly digest, The Strategic Thinker. We'll have time for Q&A at the mics at the end. Please join me in welcoming Rich to Google. Thanks, Joy. Appreciate it. Thanks. So uh, this past Saturday morning, I'm sitting in my home office. It's about 7 o'clock. And I'm listening to a CD that I had recorded a few days earlier on strategy. And I was just checking to see if I needed to make any changes. And about 7.30, my eight-year-old son named Luke came into the room. And he plops down on the big brown leather chair. And I watch him listen for about a minute or so. And finally, being the dad, I had to ask, so Luke, what do you think of dad's new CD on strategy? I'm excited, right? And he goes, it sounds like church. <laughs> and so, you know, not putting that together right away, I said, well, church, how is it like church? He said, well, there's a lot of talking, I don't understand most of it, and I think I'm getting sleepy. <laughs> and in fairness to Luke, I think discussions sometimes of strategy can be that way, but not usually when we apply strategy to you, which is what we're going to do today. Uh, you know, there's a simple but often overlooked premise in life, and that is new growth comes from new thinking. You know, new growth comes from new thinking. Expecting new growth for your career, for your business, for your relationships, for your finances, without new ways of thinking about them, is like a farmer expecting new crops to grow without first planting the seeds. And that's really the goal of the session this afternoon, is to give you some new concepts, some new tools to think strategically about your life, your work, your relationships, your career, okay? And so as we do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about strategy overall, and obviously being here at Google, you, you understand strategy better than most. But we're gonna talk not just about business strategy, but how do you take some of those key principles of strategy, it's principles that have been around thousands of years, and actually use them to be happier, more successful, however you define success, in your life. Now when we think about strategy, really what we're thinking about is here's where we are today, here's where we want to go. Strategy is the bridge that takes us from where we are to where we want to go. So from a business standpoint, many of you have goals and objectives for your plans for the year. The strategy, as you know, is how you get from where you are today to reach those goals and objectives. From a personal perspective, strategy is looking at where are you right now in your life? Mind, body, relationships, finances, spirituality. And where do you really want to be with those different areas? You know, a lot of times we bounce around from one thing to the next like a, 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 a pinball with no real direction. And strategy, or that bridge, can kind of give us that direction. It can help channel what we're good at, what we like to do, who we like to help from a profit or nonprofit perspective, and we can find ways to do that effectively and in ways that other people value. You know, great strategy is not just from a business standpoint or a political standpoint or a military standpoint. It's designed to help us take back that power in our lives. You know, I don't know about you, but oftentimes I feel a little bit like I don't have control. Things are going in a lot of different directions. I'm bouncing around. Strategy is a way to take some of that control back, to take some of that direction back. So in 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, we can look back and say, you know what? I did the most with what I have. The biggest thing we don't want to do, and when you interview folks that are in their 70s and 80s and 90s, the biggest thing is folks looking back with regret to say, I could have maybe done this for work, 
or I could have maybe been in this relationship, or I could have maybe volunteered more often, but I didn't do it. So what we want to do today is talk a little bit about how do we do that? How do we make sure we realize our full potential? And really, as we talk today, we're going to be talking about how do you make those decisions? Just out of curiosity, how many folks here, show of hands, how many of you have a written business plan for the group that you work with? Just a show of hands. Any of you guys have written business plans for what you do? Okay, maybe about half. All right, a third. Uh, how about personally? How many folks have a written plan? It doesn't have to be a 20-page plan because we know we, those never get used. But how many folks have written down some of their goals, professionally, personally, and then how you're going to get there? Okay, so good. Maybe about 25, 30%. That's actually more than uh, we normally see. Because what the research showed, and I, in the last couple of years, did research with about 2,500 adults in the United States. And what we found is that about 15% of adults have a written plan for their lives. So career, relationships, finances, spirituality, about 15%. What was interesting is that we also did a separate study looking at folks that worked for Fortune 1000 companies. So folks that were managers in Fortune 1000 companies what we found was that only 22% of those folks had a written plan for their life. The interesting thing is, you know, when you look at strategy for business, we know that historically and from a research perspective, strategy is very important to successful businesses. Um, there was just recently completed a 25-year study on 750 bankrupt companies. And what they found was that the number one cause of bankruptcy over the last 25 years was bad strategy. So companies not having either an established strategy or working with a flawed strategy, that was the number one cause of bankruptcy. And today you open up the paper, you see companies like United Airlines, Borders, <coughs> companies that we're very familiar with, bigger companies sometimes, going bankrupt. So we do know in business, from a business perspective, strategy is important. From an individual perspective, as managers potentially, Strategy is also important. There were two separate studies on leadership published in the Wall Street Journal and Chief Executive Magazine. And both of those studies on leadership found that the number one most valued skill in leaders today is strategic thinking. But interestingly, 50% of companies reported that strategic thinking is the skill their leaders most needed to improve. And in the research for my previous book, Deep Dive, what I found is that only about three out of every 10 managers are strategic, so about 30%. So what we want to do today is say, how can we raise that level? How can we take what we do day in and day out and give it a little bit of direction, right? None of us want to be pigeonholed and say, in three years you're going to do this, in five years you're going to do this, in seven years you're going to do this, right? We don't want that. But what we do want is to take what we're good at, what we're passionate about, and channel that so that we're using that as we move through. What that looks like in three or four years, you might not know. But we at least want to have that mapped out so that we're, we're making progress and we're realizing our potential, whatever that might be. So as, as I did the research for this last book, what we found is that there's roughly five steps to developing a strategy for your life. Um, these also tend to coincide with business, uh, business strategy as well. But for this uh, instance, really five steps in creating that strategy for life. And so those five steps are, number one, discover. Secondly, differentiate. Third, decide. Fourth, design. And then fifth, drive. So what we're going to do in the next half hour or so is just kind of walk through each of these areas and then would certainly like to open it up to, uh, to any questions, comments, observations that you might have from your life and maybe some of the things that you found successful in driving or developing strategies for yourselves. So the first step is discover. And discover means we've got to first understand where are we today? You know, we got to stop and say where are we today? We've got to get an idea of what does our situation look like? And it's important for several reasons. And first, we'll talk a little bit about Katie Couric. Maybe not the most flattering shot of Katie, but uh, we know Katie Couric for years and years, very successful co-host of today's show with Matt Lauer, year after year ranked number one. About five years ago, she went to the CBS Evening News, and you can't blame her, 13, 14 million a year, so it's, it's incentive. And 
Each year, though, she was ranked dead last in viewership, year after year. Even about 500,000 viewers behind the anchor who was in the seat from CBS that nobody knew before her. So we wonder, well, what happened to Katie in that five-year time frame? Did she just become a mumbling, bumbling broadcaster? And the answer is no. What happened, though, is her situation changed, her context changed who she was talking to, what she was talking about, the time of day she was talking about, all those things changed. And because her situation changed, it negatively impacted her performance, or at least her perceived performance. So one of the things we want to do is find a way to understand what's going on in our life. Okay? What's going on in our life. And when you build a bridge, one of the first things that happens, in addition to the, uh, to the surveying things, is you create a survey of the site, right? Understand, you know, what's the composition of the ground like? What's the distance we've got to span? Where are we going to take this bridge? What types of materials might be appropriate? So we create that survey or snapshot of what's happening. So we can do that for ourselves as well. And most of the things we talk about today, we're going to do visually. Because I think visually tends to connect a little bit quicker. So when we look at a survey of ourselves, we can potentially break it down into four areas. And there's other areas we can consider, but four we can consider for today are mind, body, relationships, and finances. Mind, body, relationships, and finances. So when it comes to mind, you know, things that we're, we're thinking about relative to potentially our career, our work, our spirituality, the things that, that tend to be top of mind day in and day out. From a body perspective, what's our health like? Are we in good shape? Do we think we need to be in better shape? Do we have a history of medical illnesses that we need to be aware of? What, from a physical body perspective, are some of the key things that we need to think about? Relationships, family, friends, coworkers. Where are we at with those? Are they strong across the board? Are we not spending as much time with kids or with friends that we're close to because work's dominating? So where are the relationships at? And then finances, and again, you know, as we move forward, if you have families, where are we financially? Where do we want to be? Do we have a plan for getting there? So what we can do then is populate this, this tool with kind of what's top of mind for us in each of those areas. So if we start with body, maybe we say, you know, the few times that we have exercised in the morning, it's really jump-started our day. So that might be a key as far as getting our plan set. Uh, we know that when we're, when we're around the house, diet's pretty good. But generally, if we're traveling, we kind of fall off the wagon. We're eating, drinking kind of maybe what stuff that we shouldn't be. Relationship-wise, maybe we, we say, you know, I'm not spending as much time with my friends as I used to. We've got maybe more family commitments, kids, things like that. But those relationships are still important. How do we make sure they don't wither and die? Um, we also might be thinking about coworkers. You know, maybe we've got a new coworker. It's maybe not going great right away. How do we build that relationship so that it becomes a stronger, more vital one to our group? Financially, what are we doing long term? Uh, what are we doing from a part, uh, partner or spouse perspective? They want to go to Europe. How do we get that set up so that that happens? And then from a mind perspective, we're thinking about work. What do we need to do to di differentiate ourselves, to move up in the organization, maybe to get more responsibility? And then also, um, are we looking for opportunities to volunteer? So again, these are just some generic examples. But really what we want to do with this tool is give ourselves a way to take a snapshot of what's happening in our lives. You've got it all kind of fluttering around in your mind. But if you don't put it on paper, it generally doesn't tend to, um, to, to provide that foundation for the plan that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So once you've taken a snapshot of what's going on around you, what we can then do is start to think about where do we want to go? And as we know, most of the time, we're setting our goals. And I developed a simple framework. I use this with um, business managers primarily, but you can also apply it to your life. Goals and objectives, of th that part of GHOST, goals and objectives are what you're trying to achieve. Strategy and tactics, how you are going to get there. And you say, well, sure, Rich, everybody knows that. Not necessarily. A couple years ago, uh, one of the CEOs of a prominent company out this way, and I won't say the name, um, came out in, uh, when, when she first started and said, the primary strategy for our company is to grow our audience, which is terrific. But that's not a strategy. Okay? That's the goal. How you grow the audience is the strategy. 
So as you think about this in relation to yourself, your goals, what do you want to achieve? Whether it's work, whether it's your health, whether it's relationships, what specifically do you want to achieve? You got to start with the goal, then the objective. And we've heard smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound. So what specifically? Strategy and tactics then is that bridge, how you're going to get there. Okay? So let's look at a couple examples. Business wise, we might have one that says our goal is to win a quarterly sales contest for our region. The objective then, more specifically, what we want to achieve, achieve 200,000, 250,000 in sales by the end of the third quarter. Strategy then, how generally are we going to get there? Focus our selling efforts on expanding share of wallet with current customers. And then tactically, we might do a sell sheet, video of customers using the products and so forth. How do we apply that then to our personal lives? The goal might be to lose weight. You know, we're just getting through the winter. I'm from Chicago. We tend to eat a lot of stuffed pizza in the winter. So the goal might be lose some weight. The objective more specifically is lose 15 pounds in six months. The strategy then, how generally are we going to do it, is to eliminate weight causing behaviors and create healthy habits. So tactically, specifically, we might do things like try and drink more water as opposed to those two or three sodas a day, um, get a treadmill, get some strength bands, eat protein based breakfast, do some of those things. So again, many of you, it sounded like are doing this already, but we've got to be able to jot down the goal, what are we trying to achieve, the objective, the strategy, and the tactic. Okay? So again, we don't have a lot of time today, but one of the exercises I'd recommend is take a few minutes. Think about your work. Think about your relationships. Think about your finances. What are some of the goals? And what are the strategies you're going to use to get there? Okay? About 1974, I think it was a, a roughly August 7th, uh, a Frenchman by the name, to, by the name of uh, Philippe Petit did something that no one had done before and no one has done since. He set up a wire, a 450 pound cable, between the twin towers of the World Trade Center and for about an hour he walked on that high wire 1,350 feet above the streets of Manhattan jumping, dancing, laying down, no harness, no safety wire, nothing for about an hour. And then finally was pulled off by the, uh, the police as it started to rain. So we look at that and we say, very interesting, it was actually called the artistic crime of the century. And there's a great documentary called Man on Wire. It won the 2008 Academy Award for Best Documentary. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's fairly interesting. And it documents what he did. And some say, well, you know, that's just a, it was just kind of a, a spur of the moment, a whim, a lark. And actually, it had been, that, that moment had been preceded by six years of him planning with a group of about 10 people in order to be able to set this up and do it. So at the end of the day, he took what's obviously a very common activity, which is walking, and he did it in a way that the people who've seen it or seen the documentary will never forget. So he took a common activity and he made it his own through his unique talent and his unique passion. And anytime you develop strategy for your career, for your business, inherently there's going to be risk. You know, if you're, if you're comfortable every day in everything that you do, you're probably not really maximizing your potential. Great strategy demands that you take risks. Reed Hastings, who many of you know, I'm sure is the CEO of Netflix, has said, if you don't feel pain when you're developing strategy, then you have not developed strategy. So one of the things that I'd like you to think about in the next few minutes is, what are some of the unique talents, the activities, the passions that you have that others don't? And how have you, in the past, used those to bring value to yourself and to other people around you? So the second step in our process is differentiate. You know, when you look at most great companies, you can very quickly understand how they differentiate themselves from the other companies they compete with in order to be successful. You know, a company like yours, obviously, 
you've driven a lot of your differentiation around this idea of play from a culture perspective because play leads to innovation which leads to new value for customers. So what I want you to think about is how do we differentiate? And I'll give you a couple more examples. There's a British artist named Damien Hirst. And Damien Hirst has become a very popular, maybe infamous in some circles, um, artist because what he's done is he's taken art and he's done it very differently than most anyone else out there in the world. What he started to do or what he's been doing is taking animals, dead animals, okay, I'm, I'm not a part of PETA and if you are please direct comments to Damien, but he's been taking dead animals and putting them in formaldehyde and using them in different ways, different positions, different forms to create artwork. This is one of his most famous pieces. Now we can argue all day, is that art or is it not art? And I'm not gonna say which side I'd fall on, but the reality is by doing art in a different way, a way that's meaningful to him, he's become the most wealthy uh, British living artist, um, valued his, his net worth about $350 million. So again, we're not saying that that's the be all end all of art, but the reality is he's one example of an artist who's done things differently to be successful. You look at an entertainer like Johnny Cash, right? We know Johnny Cash, American singer, songwriter. When you listen to his recordings, never the best voice, really, but what made him successful, what made him endeared to many people is his ability to tell a true, authentic story in a way that resonated with people. Another example of doing things differently. I'm from Chicago and there's a restaurant in Chicago called Alinea and the chef there is a, uh, a person by the name of Grant Ackett's. And Grant Ackett's in 2008 was named the number one chef in uh, the United States and last year his restaurant Alinea was named the number one restaurant in North America by Restaurant Magazine. So you say, wow, he's a very successful person um, he's also overcome cancer uh, in, in this whole process, which has been um, a testament to his character. So how do you top that? So what he decided to do was a completely different concept when it comes to restaurants for his next restaurant. And his, his new restaurant is called Next. And Next, what they do is they have four menus for the year. Each of the menus represents a different time and a different place in history. So. Paris, 1906, or Sicily, 1949, or Hong Kong, 2036. And for three months, that's the menu. You don't make a reservation, you have to buy tickets. Ticket prices differ based on the week of the day and the time of the day. So if you want tickets for Wednesday night at 9 o'clock, they're going to be less expensive than Saturday night at 7 o'clock. <coughs> All of the cost is included within that ticket. So when you go, you're not tipping anyone, you're not paying extra for drinks, everything's included. You can also get a subscription um, so that you can have tickets for each of the four. So again, we think about dining, restaurants, very similar activity, but Grant has done it in a different way that's helped him stand out um, among, amongst his peers. So I'd like you to think about, and if you have a pen and paper, maybe jot down, but think about what are some of the unique traits activities, skills that you have that you're able to bring value to yourself or to other people in your life? What makes you unique? Your talent, your passion, okay? So think about that as you move forward. Several years ago, uh, my wife Ann and I were on safari in Africa. and We took a tour of a Maasai Mara tribal village led by a native guide and he said, the tribal leader in this village has seven wives because the women in the village do most of the work from washing the clothes in the stream to building the huts that you see out of sticks and cow dung. So if you've been to Africa, some of the places, the huts, the houses they live in are actually made of dried cow dung, which is interesting. Anyway, we're finishing up the tour. The tribal leader, the one with seven wives, emerges from his hut and begins talking with some of the tourists. As we're about to leave, I noticed a tribal leader talking to my wife, Ann. So being the interested husband, kind of wandered over to eavesdrop on the end of the conversation. And he said to her, 
We have much work to do here, but our lives are simple and good. I am always looking for the right people to carry on our traditions. I find you to be attractive and sturdy. Would you like to be one of my wives? Now, in fairness to my wife, Anne, I think being called sturdy in Africa is a compliment to women. I'm not, not so sure it would be here. <laughs> so after a long pause by Anne, a little too long for my liking, she said, you know, I love the land here, and the animals are beautiful, but seeing as how many married, I'll respectfully have to pass. So on the bouncy Jeep ride back to camp, I couldn't let that conversation go without just a little jab. So I said, you know, honey, it sounds like your decision earlier boiled down to me or a house of cow dung. And she said, yes, and it was much closer than you think. Because the reality is in business and our personal lives, we're constantly faced with trade-offs. Trade-offs involve incompatible activities. More of one thing means less of another. And inherently, when we make trade-offs, we're making decisions. So step three of our process is decide. And the word decide or decision comes from the Latin word decidere, which means to cut off. If you have trees on your property, you know that every few years, you've got to cut off, you've got to prune some of the low branches, some of the dead branches, to promote new growth. Think about your work. Think about your personal life. We're very good about adding things to our plate. But how often do we stop and actively, consciously take things off of our plate? Especially from a work standpoint, I see it very often. You know, you're adding more projects, you're adding more work because you want to be that team player and all of a sudden you're spread too thin and you're not as valuable to your team or to the business unit as you could be because there's no focus. The same thing happens with our lives. You know, we mean well, we want to volunteer on a number of different nonprofit um, opportunities. We want to make sure we get to our kids' events. We want to stay late and, and make sure we get that project done. But suddenly, sometimes we feel like we've spread ourselves too thin. So we want to understand how can we focus a little bit more on what's really valuable to us and the people that we care about at work and at home. And one of the ways to do that is to come up with a not-to-do list. And this isn't a revolutionary concept, but what I have found is, as I do leadership um, programs on strategic thinking uh, with managers around the world, what I found is that the great managers or leaders are the ones that are crystal clear on what they and their teams are not going to do. Everybody has a to-do list, but the great leaders are the ones that are crystal clear on what they're not going to do. So that comes to our personal lives as well. You know, we have to make those trade-offs, otherwise they get made for you, right? And that's when we feel like we don't really have control of what's going on. We feel like we're spread too thin. So one of the things you may consider doing is a not-to-do list. You know, look at those areas that we talked about. Look at work. What are some of the activities, the projects, the reports, the tactics that you think you should stop doing because they're no longer bringing value? Think about your personal life from a financial perspective. Where are areas that you're spending money that aren't really adding value long-term to you or the people that you care about? So think about that not-to-do list as potentially a way to create greater focus, not only at work, but in your personal lives as well. When you create a house, when you create uh, a building, when you create a bridge, generally you start with a blueprint, right? If you were gonna have a new house built, and you talk to the architect, and they just showed up on the job site and had people start digging, and you said, well, where's the blueprint? And he said, or she said, we don't have a blueprint. You'd think, oh my, we're, what do you mean we don't have a blueprint? How do we know what we're actually gonna do? Because we don't have a blueprint. Yet in business and in our personal lives, very, uh, a good number of folks operate without that blueprint. And so design is that fourth step. Once you've kind of discovered where you are, step one, you've differentiated in step two and thought about what are your unique talents and passions and how do you bring those together. 
And in step three, you've decided where am I going to focus my time, my talent, and any finances to be happy, to be successful. Now we get to design. Design means we need to lay out that plan. And planning in a lot of, in a lot of places has negative baggage with it. You know, well, we develop a plan, but it sits in a binder on the shelf. How many of you actively use your business plans at work day in and day out to drive your activities? Okay, a couple people. A lot of the Fortune 500 companies that I do work with, this is kind of the scenario. They have a plan, sits in the binder, sits in the PowerPoint deck. Here's what they do day in and day out, and there's no link. There's no link. So what we want to do is try and create that link between what is the plan that we have and what are we doing day in and day out. And so one of the more common planning tools that's out there is SWOT analysis. And I know SWOT analysis is the most commonly used strategic planning tool in the world. In my opinion, it's probably the most misused. Because we've seen SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. We say, yeah, 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 we've been there, done that. But if we do it correctly, we can generate some insights and help start at least the foundation of that plan. And what I want to share with you today is not just SWOT, but what would you do after a SWOT analysis to actually develop strategy for your life? Okay, so I'll show you a quick example. Here's a SWOT example that you might have. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and, and threats. Strengths, coaching. Maybe you do some volunteer work with your daughter's um, ice skating team or your son's baseball team. Maybe you like to coach. Maybe you're good at that. Uh, maybe you're a leader at school. There's a parent-teacher organization. You do a lot of good work with that. Uh, maybe you have fundraising abilities. Maybe you're working with a couple nonprofits, and obviously, as the economy has been poorer, it's difficult for nonprofits to survive, so you've used some of your fundraising abilities. That's a strength. Weaknesses. Maybe we're not as good a listener as we could be. Maybe we've been in a relationship for a long time, and we're not really locked in in listening to what our partner or spouse or significant other is saying. Uh, maybe we're quick, too quick to judge folks. You know, a lot of times we look at somebody, you know, you, and, and you take 10 seconds and you say, I, I know what that person's about. So maybe we need to step back a little bit there. Maybe we're not fully engaged with family at home. Maybe work's taken over, email, texting, Twitter. Maybe we're doing a lot of that stuff and we're not fully engaged when we're at home. Opportunities. Maybe the formation of a new nonprofit group training for new managers at work. Maybe there's an executive led or manager-led class that we could be a part of. Um, and then maybe our daughter's interest in art is an opportunity for us. Threats. Maybe there's some company downsizing. Um, communities lack of participation. Maybe people aren't reaching out and, and, and helping as much as they used to with community events. And then maybe there's a property tax increase that financially we need to think about because maybe that affects some of our vacation plans. So what we can do then is once we've developed the SWOT analysis, we can say, how do we prioritize the opportunities that we have? You all have time, talent, and finances to some degree. How do you prioritize where that goes? You can use an opportunity matrix to do that, looking at two criteria. What's the probability of achievement if I put my resources, my time, my talent, my budget to that? And then what's the impact on my life if I do? Very common uh, tool that we use in business to, to vet opportunities, but you can use it in your personal life as well. So maybe when we plot our opportunities, we say, well, the formation of the nonprofit group, the probability is not as high because that's dependent on a lot of other people and we're having difficulty getting people involved. Training for new managers, maybe the probability, the impact is a little bit higher there. We've got good relationships at work, there's a need at work, so maybe we can do that. And then maybe the number one opportunity is Susie's interest in art. She's our daughter. We're maybe not spending as much time at home. The impact could be great if we can find out a way, find out a way to be involved with that. Same thing with the threats that we face. And again, threats are things that potentially can stop us from reaching our, our level of happiness or success. Pro what's the probability that that would occur, 1 to 10? What's the impact on our lives? So again, community's lack of participation. Probability is high, the impact maybe not as much on us. The property tax increase, something that we're thinking about. Company layoffs, again, maybe the biggest thing that kind of is top of mind. So now you say, okay, great, Rich, we did the SWOT analysis. We prioritized our opportunities and threats. So what? 
That's the biggest question I get when I do strategic planning with companies is, we did SWOT analysis, so what? Who cares? We don't do anything with it. So this last tool is a way to take your SWOT analysis, your <coughs> strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and actually create strategies, okay? I know this is a little busy, but what you've done is you have your strengths and weaknesses at the top, right? You already did that as part of your SWOT analysis. You have your opportunities and threats listed on the left-hand side. You already created those in your SWOT analysis. All you're doing now is you're playing around with the combination of your strengths and weaknesses, which are your internal capabilities, relative to your opportunities and threats, which are your external possibilities. So we can see, if we look at our strengths and opportunities, we have leadership ability at school, coaching, maybe we haven't really used that at work. So one of the opportunities is to use that leadership ability to create a proposal to lead one of those managerial classes at work. If we drop down and look at strengths and threats, one of the strengths that we have is fundraising abilities. So maybe we create a fundraising event for the community to generate greater interest because that's a threat, the community's lack of interest, um, to help needy children. So again, if you do SWOT analysis as part of your work or part of your life, this is a way for you to line those things up to create some strategies, to create some direction for what, how you're using your time and your talent. Okay. So the last step, the fifth step, is drive. When we think about the word drive, it can have a lot of different connotations. Very leisurely Sunday drive, maybe in the mountains, just relaxing. Maybe you're thinking more of a Formula One race car or NASCAR trading paint. But the word drive really talks about, really means, you know, to put effort forth, to move something from one spot to another. We can do all the thinking, we can do all the planning we want, but at the end of the day, if we don't have the preparation and the perseverance and the will to move things forward, then we've wasted time. I work with a lot of organizations when I look at how they've done planning in the past, there's no drive. They've spent the time in the two-day off-site meeting at the Holiday Inn twice a year, but when it comes to executing, they're not executing. So we want to talk a little bit about what's a way, what's a tool for us to drive success in our personal lives and potentially at work. And the tool that we can potentially use is called an activity system map. An activity system map is simply a way to look at your life, to look at your business on one page. Okay, one page. And there's really two components. The first component is your strategic themes. Your strategic themes are the three to five areas that really you want to invest the most resources in to provide that value to yourself, to the other people in your life. So three to five areas that really you want to focus on this year to reach your potential. The tactics then are the second part. The tactics or activities are the things that you're actually going to do to realize those strategies. So let's look at an example. Our, our, our strategic themes might be empathy, teaching, and growth, okay, as we look at our plan for 2012 on an individual level. Empathy, teaching, and growth. Those are our three strategic themes. Those are the areas we want to invest our time and our talent into. The tactics or activities then support those. So for growth, it might be things, to, things like committing to exercise five days a week, joining Toastmasters public speaking group so that I can successfully lead that class at work that I talked about earlier, and maybe researching cultures uh, of foreign countries that we're considering visiting so that my spouse or partner can have a wonderful time if we do make that trip overseas. So individually, those things don't look that important, but where the power comes from is when you develop this map fully and you've said to yourself, here are the three to five areas I'm going to focus on, and here are the actual things I'm going to do to realize my potential in those areas. Okay? 
So empathy, practicing active listening at home, volunteering, mentoring, uh, teaching, coaching, fundraising in the community. Uh, we talked about the class and maybe learning new subjects in summer uh, with our kids. Maybe that art class with Susie um, that we both take together. So we want to think about how do we simply capture our strategy for our life. The activity system map is one way to help us drive that day in and day out. Whether it's in business or your personal life, great strategy should be simple. Um, I have a daughter named Jessie, she's six years old, and her favorite, uh, doctor, her favorite book is the Dr. Seuss book, Green Eggs and Ham. And if Dr. Seuss was a strategist, I think he would have written something along the lines of, I am strategic, strategic I am. Do you like to think strategically? I do not like to think strategically, not in an office, not in a tree. It's more fun to think tactically, stuff I can touch, stuff I can see. I do not like to think strategically. I haven't the time to be so leisurely. Setting good plans, I'll leave to others. Got to check my Blackberry even in bed under the covers. <laughs> no, I do not like to think strategically. I prefer the adrenaline rush of mindless reactivity. You do not like to think strategically, so you say, try it, try it, and you may. Say, I do like to think strategically. While others around me only fight fires, I focus my resources taking my business higher. I schedule time just to think. Now my goals and strategies are in perfect sync. Strategic I am. So the bottom line is, we need to keep strategy simple if we're actually going to do it day in and day out. The reality is, if you don't carve out time in your schedule, either individually or with other people, to think about your work, to think about your life, it's going to happen to you. It may happen well, and it may not happen so well. And are there going to be une unexpected things that happen along the way? Absolutely. But if you have no direction, if you haven't channeled what you're good at, what you're passionate about, then you've wasted your potential. Michelangelo was quoted as saying, a person paints with their mind, not with their hands. We live in an action-oriented world, but never forget that your success in business and your personal life begins here first. Give yourself permission, time, and tools to think strategically. Strategy is the bridge from where you are today to where you want to go. Without that bridge, you have no way of successfully spanning the gaps in your life. Without that bridge, you don't have a way to overcome the barriers in certain cases. But with that strategy or with that bridge, you have the power to go from where you are today to where you want to go. The question is, will you use your potential to reach that destination? Uh, what I'd like to do now is open it up for any comments, any questions, any thoughts that you might have. I always enjoy hearing from people how they've approached planning, whether it's for their business or for their personal lives, and um, an opportunity to maybe share some best practices. So we do, is there, there's a microphone here, if, uh, or we can just pop up. So I think these are really great tools and stuff, but once you develop your strategy, I think the question is how can you develop resolution and be determined Yeah, so the question was, once you develop your strategy, you know, that's one thing, but how do you get that resolution to kind of see it through? You know, a lot of people make New Year's resolutions, right? And it's end, uh, beginning of March, and probably a lot of people, those are gone now. So the question becomes, how do, we, you know, how do we stay focused on it? I'm a big believer in the fact that concepts change thinking and tools change behavior. So you, if you're going to change your behavior, if you're going to actually follow through on your strategies, you have to have a tool, something like an activity system map with the three bubbles that sits on your desk or sits on your nightstand or on your, on your bathroom counter that you're looking at on a regular basis to trigger that change in behavior. If you don't have a, a, a way in your environment to change that behavior, it's not going to happen. 
So the best successes I've heard from people are to have a, a trigger that changes behavior. Something like the activity system map can, can do that for you. So thank you. Other comments, thoughts? Okay. Well, I'll stick around if you, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Can you show what to do with the SWOT analysis again? You had this chart with weaknesses. And yeah, so yeah. The, uh, uh, that one. This one? That one. Yeah, so what you're doing is you're lining up your strengths and weaknesses okay. and your opportunities and threats, and you're just using these four boxes as kind of a methodical way to think through. So this box, you're meshing your strengths and your opportunities together. So you're saying, here are the things I can take advantage of. How can I do that with what I'm good at? If we go down here, we're matching our strengths and our threats. So these are things potentially that can prevent us from being happy or successful. How do we use our strengths to prevent those things from derailing, derailing our efforts. So you're just using these four boxes as kind of a, a, a trigger to think through what you're good at or where you have weaknesses, what you can take advantage of and what could hurt you. Yeah. So, hello? Yeah. yeah. So my name is Alex Aris. And, hey Alex. Um, thank you for coming and giving this talk. Uh, I very much empathize with you about strategies and uh, the importance of them and being organized and have an orderly life or mm -hmm. something. I doubt that ev every person is like that. Um, You're right, very few, 15%. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what to do with that, but you, you may know better. So one thing is that um, I have used strategies, even though I'm like an organized person, mm -hmm. I felt disappointed. Okay. So one strategy that I used was um, in order to become a you know, professor, I applied to universities and I had a strategy mm -hmm. and I had tactics, maybe informally, not okay. written down, or actually written down, but in other terms. Okay. So I applied to five universities every week. I ended up applying to 72 universities. I got one phone interview, which nothing happened. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I got an offer from Google uh, after um, things that I have not planned at all. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> someone referred me, I got a call, I missed that call. They called me again when I went back uh, another time. And then, I don't know, they were, they were very interested. I couldn't say no. I came, give it a chance. Sure. And now I'm here. Okay. So. I just want, maybe that's a comment, maybe you can yeah. comment on it, but I have another thing too. So that's more like a question. What do you do when you plan out the strategy or a tactic, mm -hmm. and then you have all that work done, and you just find that you don't want to do it? Yeah. And I, I had forced myself to do it. it it was hard, didn't, didn't work. Yeah, so to both of those, th and thank you very much. I think they're both a great comment, great question. You know, I, I think the reality is that the first step we talked about, discover. You've got to understand what's your purpose. And you know, I'm a big believer in you know, identifying what's your purpose in life. Why are you here? Okay. To your point, that purpose may translate into a lot of different things. Maybe it's a professor, maybe it's not. Maybe it's a, a leader here at Google, maybe it's not. So you've got to find your purpose. How that actually gets translated into the real world, to your point, is going to be a surprise sometimes, and that's fine. But what I see too often is people moving from one spot to another with no idea of what their purpose is, meaning where, where that intersection of talent and passion and knowledge and skill is. Because if you understand what that is, you can bring value to a lot of people, whether it's for-profit or non-profit. But the key is to first uncover that. So it sounds like you've uncovered it, and there's, there's channels, and I talk in the book about your purpose channels. So channel, one channel might be professor, but you haven't pursued that yet. But that's not to say in 10 years you may be a professor. But right now the channel is Google. And the question is, for you moving forward, how do you maximize that at Google? So excellent points. Thank you very much. Sure. Appreciate it. Any other comments, thoughts? No? Okay. Well, thanks very much. I hope you have a great rest of the day, folks. Thanks.